Dr. Mark Changizi here with your science moment. Today I'm going to talk about music and the origins of music and why we have music, how it came to be. Now, it's something I've argued in my earlier book, Harnessed How Language and Music Mimicked Nature and Transformed Ape to Man. Uh, the short story is that we didn't evolve via natural selection to have music, and that's also true for language and, and writing and all of these things, but instead cultural evolution shaped music to sound like something that we already had natural instincts for. And in fact, we have natural instincts for the sounds of human movement. We have the ability to recognize faces and facial expressions and bodily movements and, and recognize humans generally, but also in the auditory domain. We can tell when people are moving closer and farther, uh, are, what is their emotion at the time, how far away are they, are they, how are they arcing towards us versus arcing away from us. We are very adept at recognizing these things and they are all steeped in evocative emotional expressiveness because they're all about potentially, you know, interesting behavior, dangerous, um, advantageous behavior of, with, of you and somebody else in your midst. Now, in that book, uh, well, there's lots and lots of things that I, I, I go through in terms of the structures of music and show that we can explain these unique, peculiar ways that music is on the basis of, of humans, the grammatical sounds that humans have when we move, in our, in, when, when somebody's moving in your midst. Well, at the moment, I'm wor working on chord facets of it. And there's new ideas that I've been working on in terms of why music has the chord progressions that they do. And that is a, a facet that didn't come up despite another 47 kinds of things uh, coming up in that book. So what I wanted to do now is that now that I'm sort of deep 380 episodes into the Science Moment channel, um, while I'm working on these ideas in terms of why do we have chord and chord progressions, um, I don't fully understand this this new idea, but in the, rather than just waiting till it's all done and maybe another book comes out, I'm gonna sort of talk it through with you as I move forward in terms of understanding the idea. Uh, maybe it turns out not to work at all. Maybe it, it's just this turns out to be a wild goose chase, but I think there's something quite right here. So uh, for arbitrarily long, maybe just in this video, maybe in a hundred videos to come, depending on how it works out, I may be talking about aspects of this new musical idea and we'll see how it develops. So I was going to walk today through sort of some interesting things that I only recently learned about music and you know um, some people may have already known this but I didn't. Let me just fasten it up here so you can see the piano and uh, for those I'm going to try to make this so that you don't have to be a musician or a music theorist to sort of follow along and I'm gonna do everything in the key of C. So this is just the white notes. In the key of C, we have a uh, uh, middle C here. And you know, we've got the C chord and D minor and E minor and F and G and A minor. And then we have something called B diminished. And then you're back to C again and a loop. And so we have what are seven chords, in fact, um, uh, which is sort of a strange odd prime number to have, but there's these seven chords. And so when you're working in with, within a key, you tend to, but not always, but to first order, um, there's just a progression within some of these keys. And by staying in the key of C, we can keep everything on the white keys on the piano without having to jump over to the black keys. Right? Now, one, the thing that I learned recently that pushed me down this new path was that um, while seven isn't very much, still a seven-dimensional space is big and it's really just too big for most of us to think about. But in fact, my son was visiting and he was talking to me about tonic subdominance and dominance. And I had heard of them before. These are three different classes and I usually think of the tonic as being C and, and the subdominance are F and G. And that's a very common chord progression. It's like, you know, it might go C, C, F, F, G. They're, they're sort of the backbones of most music are those three chords and many, many different kinds of orders. But um, those three are, are important, but they're often called the tonic, um, uh, subdominant, dominant. But it's not just that. I, I don't think I quite realize that often people will cluster together the tonic, not just as C, but as two others. It'll have C, but also E minor and A minor. And I should, I should back up and say, it's not just that there's these tonic and subdominant and dominant, but that when it's the tonic, it's kind of blasé, nothing is really happening. If you just sort of spend your all day doing this, nothing much is happening. But when you go, it's like asking the question, 
And then when you go, now it, the tension is high and it wants to resolve back to the bass chord C in the key of C, right? So, but it's not, again, just C, F, and G. Within, it, in, within this tonic class, it turns out there's three. This is equivalent in this intuitive sense as an E minor. And that's also equivalent in this tonic sense to an A minor. So in fact, A minor, C, and E minor are all tonics in that sense. Well, I said, that's interesting. I didn't know that. And then instead of just the subdominant being F, it turns out, well, D minor, D minor also counts as a subdominant. And then for G, the dominant, it's not just G, but it's also this thing called B diminished, which is you start on the B like this. It's a little bit unusual chord relative to all the others. It's, um, this would be a B major and this would be a B minor, but in fact, it's, this is what it is in order to stay within the key. Um, so it's a B diminished is a dominant um, along with G. So now we only have, and here's, here's key, and if you're a theorist like me, who's worked in many different areas, the key thing is reduce the number of dimensions because anything beyond three is sort of, you know, or four maybe, is just going to, to be impossible to think about. All right, so now we have all of these seven chords, but there's really only three chords. And I started thinking about, all right, you know, the intuition going on in my mind is that somehow when there's movers moving around you, when they walk, when they move, when anything moves, it vibrates. It has some kind of fundamental frequency, but it has all of these other harmonics, other kinds of vibrations that are mathematically related to this. It's simple, so it's twice and four times and eight times, those are the octaves, but there's many things that all of these uh, ratios of whole numbers. And so you end up with lots of other vibrations that are the kinds of sounds that, that happen from moving or vibrating objects. So when an object is moving around you, the idea is that it may have some kind of characteristic chord that is sort of representative of the timbre of that thing. And, and a chord is sort of an extreme simpl simplification of it. But when things move toward you or away from you, they change in pitch due to Doppler. And something that's moving relatively slowly, it'll be a relatively small pitch, but it occurred to me that I had this feeling that um, these changes in chords may have something to do with uh, sounding like a direction change in terms of the mover moving around you. And just, you know, to remind you, this is what, let's say, a car, when it's passing you, sounds like or something like that, right? And I'll come back to that now. Right, right now, I just want to talk about the structure of where these three different classes, again, the tonics, which are kind of boring, the subdominants, which can be now D minor or F, which are asking a question. And then the dominance, which is either the G or a B diminished, are both rising tension, something is about to happen and, and it wants to resolve back to a tonic. What could these three different things be and how can you start to make sense of them? And the first observation I'll take you through was this. So if you start asking yourself, well, if you go from C, the very next chord, well, that's a D minor. And so a C was a tonic, and then you went to a D minor, and a D minor was the same thing as an F, so that's a subdominant. So you go from dominant to subdominant, and then you go to the next one, well, that's a tonic again. And then you do the next one, you're back to a subdominant. So you're going tonic, sub, tonic, sub, just kind of toggling back and forth. So you might think of going tonic, sub, tonic, sub, it'll be tonic again, but it's not. When you get to a G, now you're at a subdominant. That's a little bit weird. If you start toggling, you're like A, B, A, B, and then it's not A again, it's something else. It's like C, and you're like, wait a second. It means that in the underlying space, some underlying space that we're trying to understand, it's this, these togglings back and forth are probably toggling back and forth, not 100% of the way. Like if you imagine a toggling is going from one pointing in one direction and then pointing in the other direction, the idea is that, well, maybe these things and going from here to here, it actually is pointing in the opposite direction in some space, but not completely in the opposite direction. So that when you when you go from here to here, it's opposite, almost. And then you go from here to here, it's flipping opposite, almost, to it. And you go from here to here, again, opposite, almost. But by the time you've done these almosts and accumulated them three or four times, now when you go opposite, you're at something that's not in the same region as it started because you keep going and kind of, it's an approximate opposite. So, in fact, it occurred to me, let's just say, well, let's imagine that you go approximately, there's seven chords. Imagine that in this space, in some deeper space that we're trying to understand, and I think it's direction of mover space, that when you go from here to here, it's going basically to the opposite 
of whatever C was pointing at. But not exactly the opposite. It's like if there's seven chords, imagine that you uniformly distribute, distribute them around the circle. And so it's going, it's like the third out of seven. So it's not 180 degrees, which would be three and a half. There is no three and a half. So it's, let's say, let's say it only goes three sevenths of the way around. And I'm showing this at the same time, of course, so you can see. So, but now when you go from here to here, imagine when you're going from D minor to E minor, imagine that it's going three sevenths of the way around from D minor, in which case now you can see where it is on um, the circle. And when you go from E minor to F, again, it's doing the same kind of partially, almost an opposite. And you can see now we're sufficiently off kilter at, at F that when I do something like the opposite, we're kind of not in the same direction as C was at all. We're in kind of a different part of direction space, right? And if you keep on going in the same kind of way, you end up with this new plot where now the C and A minor and E minor, which were these tonics, these kinds of boring stuff that were not much is happening yet, are all clustered upwards. Whereas the F and the D minor, which are the subdominants, are all clustering kind of in their direction and the G and the B diminished are clustering in their direction. And in fact, by doing it like this and seeing it in this space, we don't really even need to think about tonics, subdominants, and dominants anymore because they wear their similarity on their sleeve in this space. You can just see they're close to each other. And in fact, now in this space that you can see that, well, in fact, A minor is kind of close to F. You could come up with, you could see their proximity. And if you were only talking about these three tonic and subdominant dominants, you wouldn't realize that, well, A minor and F are now kind of similar in the sense that they point in similar ways. And, and same for E minor and G, they're kind of similar. They all can now show their similarities depending on where you're looking in this space. Right. So that was the first observation. Now this, all we see here, so this, this space is just a well-known, this is the circle of thirds. This just is the circle of thirds, starting from C minor, jumping to, to E minor, jumping to G. Well, let me start a little bit lower. From C to E minor, and then to G, and to B diminished, and to D minor, and to F, and then we hit, hit them all, and it's A minor. So you hit them all in this way by going over two octaves, uh, skipping one every time. But the motivation for this is that by doing it, going in thirds, you are doing kind of like a minimal turn. If something is making a sound and going from a uh, one to a third, from a C to an E minor, for example, it's a minimal turn, something more like 45 degrees or 30 degrees, something in between zero and 90 degrees. Right. In fact, you can, if I do this, that's one way to do it, but I could also go, right, so this is a C, but this is a sneaky way to do an E minor. It's still an a, E minor, because the same thing as just going like, I could take this E over, over here, and I could take this G over here, which case I just have a nice simple E minor. So, but you can see it's just one little change to go from your C to your E minor, right? And uh, same for A minor. So if I wanna go from a C to an A minor, well, I can just put my third finger, right? So now I'm at an A minor. And if I keep just doing this, not much is happening in the music. It kind of sounds like it's not the, 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 the mover that you're listening to, you know. They're not, it's not doing much. And in a sense, it's just going kind of in the same direction, not doing much at all, right? Now, before I get, whereas, just to, just to hear it now, so if I'm doing a lot, if I'm going, if I'm doing, you know, iterating between these sort of tonics, but I suddenly throw in it, and let's say an F. I do something like in this domain and then go back. Something much different has happened. It's turned, it's moved, it's changed its direction a lot more. I'm, I'm gonna claim that these intuitions are in fact about the mover changing direction, right? Uh, and so, in, in fact, if, if you were here and then you went to G, then you go back to C. So I'm gonna claim that these um, chords are in fact directions. And when you move from one to the next, you're approximately going in the opposite direction, approximately, but not exactly. If you jump to a third up or down, you're kind of turning in the minimal way. And it can be done all, you always by some very small uh, motion of a single finger. And now this leads to, you can get a little bit more precise rather than just imagining that these thirds, the circle of thirds, which is a well-known space, but I'm just motivating in a different way. Rather than the circle of thirds 
uh, just being uniformly distributed around the circle, you can ask, uh, well, how far exactly is C from an E minor, right? And we already hinted at that. C to an E minor, I can get myself an E minor by moving just the C note to a B note. So, right? I only need to do one semitone change to get there. Now, to get from a C to an A minor, I've got to go here, which is actually two semitones. I got to go, I got to go two semitones. And uh, so that uh, requires sort of one and two, tem two, two semitones. If I go from C to D minor, simplest or shortest number of steps is actually to go here and here. There is no shorter way. So here I've gone one, two, and then I've gone one, and then I've gone, um, then I've gone one, two. So I had to do like two semitones, one semitone, and two semitones, or five semitones in all. And in going from F, uh, or in going from D minor to E minor, I actually have to do six. So I've got the, this one. So they each have to do two semitones, so it's six semitones in all. What I'm going to suggest to you is that, well, that's the most. There's never any need to go and moving from one chord to the next. There's never any need to do more than six um, semitone changes in total. So the thought is simply this. Um, six, we're gonna treat, if you do all six, which is the most, that's exactly the opposite of what the previous chord was. That is the opposite side of this space, this underlying direction space, what I'm gonna claim is direction space. So if six is 180 degrees, well, we can just divide 180 by six, that's 30 degrees. So if you're just making one change, like from a C to an A minor, well, that's just 30 degrees. And if I'm doing a C, um, uh, if I'm doing a C to uh, uh, to an A minor, I should have said E minor before, I'm not sure what I said. Uh, well, that's two semitones, so it's 60 degrees away. And in this way, we can walk through the same space as we did before where I was going, okay, C to a D, let's imagine that it's approximately the other side, like I said, and it was three sevenths of the way. Well, now I can say, no, this is five semitones changed, so we're gonna put it at 150 degrees or five times 30 degrees on the other side. And from here to here, well, that was exactly six steps or, or, or 180 degrees. So we're gonna walk now to the, make it on the exact opposite side. And then from E minor to F, well, that's um, requiring uh, a one step here, two steps here, and one step, so it's only four. So that puts us at, at 120 degrees, and we do this for each one all the way through, and what we get is this. All right. We now end up with this space that you can see. So I place things so that C is on top, and we imagine that, let's say, that's the person just, I'm just gonna say it, these, it, it, I don't have, I'm not providing much evidence of this yet, but I think it's fun to think about that what this means is the movers moving, in some sense, neither getting closer to you nor farther. You might imagine they're just going around in a circle around you, or they're temporarily out in front moving sideways, not getting closer or farther. Um, now you can see in this space that E minor is very close, it's just over to the right, but if I can, then I can go to uh, an A minor. It's a little bit farther from C, but I'm still kind of generally going, um, not deviating, I'm going, I'm, I'm deviating maybe toward or away, but which way is toward or away? Well, this, I think it's the case that F chord is going away from the observer and G is going toward it. And one argument for this is just that, well, there's no matter how you, you cut it, an F chord, the, 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 the shortest way to get it from an F chord to a G chord, it's always up, it's always greater. And that's also true if you look at the other cases where there's an opposite in this case, as there's a D minor and is, is the opposite of E minor. And the only way to get from here to there is also up and both E minor and G are on the same side. So those cases of exact opposites suggest that maybe G is coming toward you. And, and emotionally, there's this, it, I think fits this intuition that that's the most tense part. The part when it's about to approach you and then pass you, usually, because otherwise it's gonna actually run into you. He or she's going to get close, but then go by you and resolve to be then going back to the C, which is sort of neither close, like when it whizzes by you, it might be going again, kind of back down to a C again, to resolution, and then going away, which is F, and then coming back around for another pass. So for example, in this, you know, you can now do little graphs where you can do, uh, for example, here's a standard chord progression. It's just C, A minor, D we're doing and we can just show this now as a sequence of vectors the person is just hanging around nothing much is happening right just happening and then um, maybe 
they start to slightly move away from you. They go even, they're, they're turning, but they're potentially turning to come back. And now they're gonna go directly toward you. And you can make, and then it was, they pass you. So that it starts again. You can make it a little bit of a slower story too. You can then just make it similar kind of story, but instead it's, I'm gonna make sure I can hit all of the, I've just made the circle very circular in some sense. The mover is moving in a very tight, non-jerky way. I don't mean jerky in an attitude way, just like with sharp, sudden movements. But you can have much more sudden movements where you're suddenly, let's say, C to a D minor. Now that's much more diagonal, uh, much more triangular in, in the motions uh, if you do that, right? So you can make the music much sharper, which is just a typical, let's say. But instead, again, a, a variant on this would be to go. So again, I, I kind of walked down the C, A minor, F, and D minor side, and then jumped to G. And my claim, what I'd like to be able to show, is in fact, that's what we're in fact imagining at, you know, not consciously imagining, and not, you know, not visualizing in your brain, but your auditory system is tracking it. And so feeling the movement, and you get the meaning from the music by virtue of understanding the direction of motion, in the space by virtue of these chords, which are all uh, two semitone modulations of the bass chord of this mover, is the idea, but being modulated because of the Doppler shift. So, so the idea is that you have a person, they're just going by, and then maybe they, um, then maybe they uh, start to move away from you. But then suddenly, they start to, to come back towards you and then now directly towards you and then start to veer away and veer totally away again and then start moving away and then re farther and coming back and coming directly towards you and then veering by again all of these things all that they require at their base is two semitone changes due to the Doppler shift, which is more than what a human indeed does by virtue of a typical, even running, it's gonna be a fraction of a semitone. But nevertheless, the idea is that we can nevertheless, we know what Doppler shifts mean because we hear faster objects in our lives. And so by virtue of these, it sounds like the exaggerated uh, movements of a mover. And I'll leave it at that today. There's many other questions, though, that one wants to ask. I mean, so the first kinds of question would be, is it the case that chord progressions typically do make a loop? When you actually do their, um, their arrows and you actually ask, does it typically make a loop? Are those the ones that we prefer, especially if they're in a repeating, you know, repeating over and over again, then it suggests that the, the mover is doing the same darn thing over and over again, as opposed to, um, you know, whereas music, music, let's say that just, just, just keeps moving like this, you know, um, just going from C to A minor, C to A, it just might be that the, it's like you're just walking with a group of people, always moving in the same direction. Sometimes they're moving a little bit away from you, sometimes a little bit towards you just because you're fluctuating and undulating a little bit, but you're not getting much uh, in the way of ever turning around and coming, you know, these whole loops. That kind of music, whatever, if, if we do find that, should fundamentally feel quite different, like you're moving along with it rather than a mover moving or dancing, so to speak, around you. Uh, anyway, this is just the first kind of step, but I think having the ability to think about each of these chords, having a theoretical justification for treating, treating each of these seven chords as a specific angle of a mover moving in your vicinity is a theoretical boon in terms of, of, of what may be a, a suites of predictions that one 
can follow up on. Now that was your science moment.